Hey, everybody, and uh, welcome to our next lecture. Um, this is from the 2022 San Francisco Autism Society and Stanford Conference on Adult Autism and Developmental Disability Planning. Um, we had a lovely conference in person, but unfortunately, we had various technical glitches. So this has caused us to ask our wonderful speakers um, to record their presentations um, after the fact. And that's what we're doing right now. We're very fortunate to have John Elfin, um, a financial planner from San Ramon, who has been involved in special needs financial planning for a very long time. In fact, um, he has, it's, he's very close to this topic. He has a special needs child. And um, he's been a longtime friend of our conference. We're absolutely thrilled to have him here. He did present with Ellen Cookman, an attorney. And um, her lecture, we'll have a link um, in the notes and you can click to see her portion of the lecture. But with that said, I'm going to ask John to take it away. Okay, thanks so much, Jill. And um, as you can see, uh, my contact information is right here on the screen. Maybe when I'm done with the presentation, I'll put it back on here. Um, it, you're welcome to contact me with uh, any questions you might have. And at the conference, I, I mentioned to people, you're, you're welcome to contact me. I offer, and not just through the conference, but any new person who's interested uh, in my services, a complimentary consultation. So uh, feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in that. Um, so I will, uh, this is just some background information on myself. You can see my, my educational background. Um, I'm also one of the original board members of Sunflower Hill, which is a community for special needs adults that we helped create in uh, Pleasanton. In fact, my son lives there now. Uh, I'm a member of the Academy of Special Needs Planners. I had been a Special Olympics basketball coach for about 18 years until, until very recently. Uh, I served as a chairman of the Valley Healthcare Charitable Foundation, which is now Stanford Healthcare for a few years uh, and taught a uh, financial planning course at St. Mary's College in Moraga. Just a little background information about myself. So I'm very much in the, in the community, you know, primarily because of my son and because I do uh, focus my, my practice on families with special needs children. This is all on Ellen. I'll go past her slides. Uh, like, like Jill said, we, we had a combined um, presentation at the conference. So, but what I'll talk about today is a lot of people ask about, you know, how much am I going to need um, financially to support my special needs son or daughter for the duration of their lives? So I'll cover that today. Um, talk a little bit about the disposition of your assets after your death. Uh, so that they, so that you're you're able to maximize public benefits uh, for your special needs son or daughter. Talk a little bit about uh, protecting your assets from an insurance perspective, and then talk about able accounts. So I'll just go right to my slides and pass Allen's. Well, it seems to be a little bit of a delay. Okay, so how much is enough? So. When I do a financial plan for clients that have special needs children, or for any clients for that matter, the foundation of a plan is always retirement planning. Um, but when you have a special needs child, what I do is sort of combine the need for that special needs child into the retirement planning for your own planning, because the two are really linked. You know, we can always do a present value calculation to try to project the, the cost for your special needs child. But the reality is how you are doing financially and how much money you have and how much money you're going to spend for the duration of your life is completely linked to what you're going to be able to leave and supply for your special needs child. So I link the two things. So what we're trying to figure out from your special needs child's perspective is how much is needed outside of public benefits. And we're thinking about medical expenses, recreational expenses, educational expenses, really how much you're gonna need above and beyond what the regional center can supply or provide, I should say. Um, what S, you know, above and beyond, if you're getting supported living services like my son does, above and beyond what those expenses are. 
And you want to maybe think, you know, what are one-time expenses going to potentially be? Are you going to want to buy an ADU, you know, buy, um, create an ADU unit or buy a, a home for your child? Are you going to want to put them into a community? To be clear, just an ADU unit, for those who don't know, an accessory dwelling unit, um, which is usually a unit in the backyard or a converted garage, that kind of thing. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, or do you want to put them in a community, um, you know, a private community? So, for example, I was very close to uh, putting my son into Marbridge in Austin, and that was about $4,000 a month. And I believe, and don't quote me on this, but Casa de Ama in Southern California is, I believe, six, seven thousand dollars a month. So if you're looking for that type of community, you want to build that into the equation. And then you want to be conservative. You know, we have in California, um, it's a pretty unique place, but you know, do we really think that benefits that we get through the regional center? you know, the extra California SSI benefits, are they gonna last forever? Well, maybe they will, but maybe they won't. So we wanna try to, um, we want to try to be a little bit conservative in our calculations. So in, additional to the, in addition to those things, we wanna try to project annual expenses for both you and your child, build in inflation, which I know is a sore topic for everybody right now, taxes, and then for your assets, a rate of return. So what I have here is an example um, of uh, uh, some calculations that I did and I'm trying to move, so I can't see <laughs> this slide anyway, I'll be able to do this. But um, an example that I did for a client uh, and I changed the names to protect the innocent, but Kane is a special needs child. And so uh, we had expenses for him uh, through 2035 and then the, all the middle uh, categories are expenses for the parents, the discretionary housing, et cetera. But then we had um, expenses for Kane from 2036 through the death of the, of the parent in 2065 at 60,000 a year. And then my program only goes through the death of the parent. So what I have to do is then use the expense for the child from the uh, death of the parent through the life expectancy of the child. And then I come up with a present value calculation for those years. And in this case, it's about $825,000. So in the background, I have the assets. Like I said, I have the, the inflation and growth rates. And then I have a number of different calculations that I use, but I think the most meaningful one is what's called a Monte Carlo analysis. It uses all these all these inputs that I talked about, but it varies them each, uh, and it does a thousand iterations to come up with a probability of success. Uh, and in this case, the probability test was fifty six percent of not running out of money. And what I typically do is we'll do several different scenarios. You know, maybe in one case, uh, what's not uncommon is maybe to sell your home in the future and downsize or sell your home and rent or maybe move to a different state or, you know, just run different scenarios to, to see what the impact is to your financial situation for both you and your special needs uh, son or daughter. So, again, this, this can just help inform some of your decisions. Okay, so moving on. Um, an area that I'll talk about um, and, and, and uh, is a pretty common mistake that people make uh, is just how to title your assets and, and how to name beneficiaries. So I just want to spend a little bit of time on this. On the right side of the slide, you see qualified or retirement assets and insurance. And on the left side, what I call non-qualified assets, which is really all your other assets. And on the qualified side and in insurance, assets pass by beneficiary designation, not by the title of the asset, um, but by beneficiary designation. And typically the beneficiary, that the, the portion of these assets that you want to go to your special needs child should be named the special needs trust, not your special needs child's name individually, because if it, if it is, 
and those assets are named to them individually, typically that amount will be over the $2,000 and then disqualify them for benefits. Now, typically the primary beneficiary, if you're married, will be your spouse. And then the portion of the, that you wanna to go to your special needs child, the contingent beneficiary will be the special needs child, both for, um, both for uh, your 401ks, IRAs, Roths, and insurance. A common mistake, so even if you do that right, what I often see is a, an individual will have a bunch of IRAs or old 401ks, and they might do it right for some, but not others. And so it might be a good idea maybe to consolidate IRAs and, and um, th that way you just don't have too many different things. Uh, and it just, it, it, consolidation can make it easier to manage. On the left side of the screen for your non-qualified assets, again, what I'll often see is, is people will sometimes create a family trust or a revocable living trust, but they will forget to title their assets in that trust. And that trust, you know, if it's done correctly with a good special needs attorney, like, you know, some of the people that were uh, in the conference, like a Lorna Drope or a Kevin Urbach or, a, or an Ellen Cookman, um, uh, you know, if they're, if they're, if they're, if they're uh, written properly, they will then at your death direct the assets to go into a special needs trust at death. But what we'll often see is that even if these trusts are created, the assets sometimes are not titled in the name of that trust and they need to be. So just try to remember to make sure that, they're at, that those non-qualified assets are held in the trust. And just one other note um, it, that, and again, a mistake that I often see is you need and want to make sure that you're coordinating with other family members, very often grandparents who may have the, the best of intentions and wanna leave some extra money to your special needs child. But again, you don't wanna leave it directly into their name because it can disqualify them for uh, public benefits. So in a perfect world, you will create a special needs trust or a standalone special needs trust that's created today, not one that's created at death. And it's, it doesn't mean that you can't create one at death, but um, it, it can, it can uh, uh, work best sometimes if you create a standalone that exists today, because then you can tell or ask the grandparents, you know, if you're going to leave some money to our special needs child, you can just leave it to this standalone special needs trust that we have created today. Otherwise, they may need to create their own special needs trust. And at the end of the day, you can have several, you know, two or three special needs trusts, which can get complicated. So the main message here is coordinate. Okay, moving on. Uh, gonna talk a little bit about asset protection or, or wealth creation. And I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on life insurance uh, and, and a, little bit, uh, a little bit less time on long-term care uh, just because of time, time constraints. So life insurance. Um, sometimes I hear, I don't believe in life insurance. I don't need life insurance. Um, this, is really not about need or want. This is about evaluating life insurance as an economic tool potentially for your special needs child. And you know, when I talk to my clients, I sometimes use the analogy of a table and table legs and different assets uh, being different table legs with different characteristics. So very often, you know, somebody's house or real estate is one table leg and it's a great asset, but it has certain characteristics. It's generally not real liquid, um, but it, you know, it has, again, it can be a great asset. Uh, your retirement assets are another table leg. Uh, your non-qualified investments can be another table leg. And life insurance um, can be a, another good table leg to study that table if you have a special needs child. And why? It's tax-free, it's liquid, and it's leveraged. Um, so you want to evaluate it as such for the benefit of your special needs child. And so, you know, if it can be guaranteed, comparing it to another guaranteed investment, so compare it to a 10-year treasury. Now, 
when I gave this presentation a year ago, a 10-year treasury was about 1.7%. Well, when I did this slide a month ago, 10-year treasury was 3.7%. Now it's about 4% or maybe even a little bit higher. Um, so 10-year treasuries are a little more compelling than they were. Um, but comparing it to life insurance, you'll see, um, it, you know, it, it, I think life insurance um, compares quite well to other guaranteed uh, tax-free investments. <clears throat> and again, as I said before, a beneficiary, you're going to want it to be generally the special needs trust. And again, I don't think this should uh, uh, take the place of other investments, but potentially can complement your other, your other investments. And so different types of life insurance, I'm not going to go into each type, but in general, there's two general types of life insurance. And one is permanent insurance and one is term insurance. And term insurance uh, is, as the name implies, um, you know, sometimes there's a need for term insurance, but term insurance, there's no cash value. And when you pick, you, you know, you pick a term, 10, 15, up to 30 years, and you pay that premium. And after that term, if you don't die in that period of time, then you don't get anything for the premium that you paid. And statistically, um, people outlive term insurance something like 97% of the time in that, in that realm. So for the purposes of your special needs child, and, and I'm not saying, you know, for a young family, there's times you need it, but that may not be the best idea for, uh, you know, for the benefit of, of this conversation. Permanent insurance um, can be guaranteed as long as you pay the premium, meaning it will pay a death benefit. Uh, as long as as long as you pay the premium, and permanent insurance is generally whole life, universal life, variable universal life. And the example I'm going to show is what's called second to die insurance. And second to die insurance pays the death benefit only after the second person, in most cases a couple. Uh, let me, I'll use the example of a husband and a wife. So only after the husband and the wife pass away. Um, and so neither of those two people will benefit from the insurance, only say the kids or the special needs child, who in this case would be the beneficiary or the special needs trust will be the beneficiary. So it's for that purpose, for the kids or the special needs trust. I'm not saying that's always the best solution. It, it always depends on the circumstances. So if I'm working with a family, we're going to look at everyone's circumstances. Second to die isn't always the best solution, but pretty often, in, in you know, when there's a special needs child in the mix, um, sometimes it does make a lot of sense. So I'm going to show you an example of what it might look like, and I just so I'm showing you an illustration now. For um, uh, there, there, if, if you're really interested in more detail, this is a part of an illustration. I can send you the complete illustration. This is only a couple pages of about 70, um, but I can send you the full illustration if you are interested. Uh, this happens to be a Prudential uh, is the insurance company. This example is a 50 year old healthy adult. It's the second best uh, health rating, preferred non-tobacco, uh, same with the female, 50-year-old, healthy adult. So it's the second best rating. There's about seven or eight ratings worse, in which case the premium would be higher all the way to being declined. So, you know, your health rating will, will dictate, uh, will be part of what dictates the, the premium. This is for a million dollar death benefit. Premium in this case, 6,683. And so what you see here on the right is what the internal rate of return uh, would be, uh, you know, after the second death at a certain age. So, for example, if the second person if, or if both people had died at age 70, the internal rate of return is 15.67. The taxable equivalent, and, and they're assuming a 35% taxable rate is 24.11. Now, going back to what I said earlier, you know, you can't get a guaranteed rate that comes close to that, right? So I would say it's a pretty compelling 
uh, you know, pretty compelling economic tool uh, if you were, you know, if you were to pass away that early. And then going to the next page, even at age 80, uh, you know, internal rate of return of eight, almost 8.6 and taxable equivalent of 13.2, same thing for a guaranteed rate. And then, you know, going to age 90, 5.4 and 8.3. Again, comparing that to a 10 year treasury, I think all compelling rates. So again, uh, I think uh, something to be considered, guaranteed to maybe supplement some of your other investments uh, to take maybe some of your income or some of your assets uh, for the benefit potentially of your kids or, or particularly your, your special needs child. Okay, moving on. Um, Long-term care, I'm just gonna to touch on this, not gonna to go too, too much into it just from, from a time perspective, but the reason you wanna maybe consider long-term care insurance is to protect your assets. Uh, and people th you know, most commonly think about this um, nur of a nursing home, but it can be in an assisted living facility or even cover you in your home. And it kicks into gear when you can't do two out of the six activities of daily living. And you can see them listed here, bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, eating, or incontinence. And the two basic types, and there's even you know, more, uh, it, more types in this, but the two basic types are traditional, which is kind of like term insurance. You pay a premium uh, and you, know, you, 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 you only use it um, if you can't do two out of the six activities of daily living. And um, uh, when you get this type of insurance, the premiums, you know, your initial premium actually can go up once you get the, once you get the insurance. And about seven, eight, nine years ago, the, uh, the, the premiums for this traditional type of long-term care insurance went up three or four times what they were. So it's, it's gotten quite expensive. Why? Because you know, the population is aging and, and the incidence of using this, of needing this insurance has gone up quite a bit. A hybrid long-term care is uh, kind of a, a, an add-on to life insurance. Um, and so it's a life insurance product uh, that has a component uh, of, of long-term care. And in my experience, you know, this has fit with more clients um, than the traditional in the last several years uh, and, and makes more sense more often. Um, but um, again, I'm, I, I don't have examples of it again, just from a time, uh, time perspective, but happy to share those with you if you would like. But, but going back to this again, the, perp the main purpose of, the, of these long-term care products or insurance is to protect your assets so you don't spend them down and then you can pass them on, hopefully to your, to your loved ones after you pass away. Okay, ABLE accounts. <clears throat> um, achieving a better life experience, signed into law in 2014. This is the first time that a special needs individual can have money in their name and still qualify for public benefits. Um, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, it's the same, same tax code as a 529 college account. If you have children that have opened, you know, if you've opened a, a 529 college account uh, for your other children or maybe even your special needs child, um, it's the same tax code. So like a 529 college account, money you put into an ABLE account grows tax-free and then you can take it out tax-free as long as you use it as a, as a qualified expense, disability expense. So just from a tax perspective, it's a, a really great thing. Um, to qualify, you have to be, you, know, sort of, you have to have a certification of disability. And if you are SSI eligible or SSDI eligible, um, you typically will qualify as long as you were disabled uh, if prior to 26. Uh, otherwise, again, you have to, uh, you have to put in a you have to put in an application to certify that you're disabled. But my experience is typically if people are a regional center client, they will qualify. Contribution limits are $16,000 a year from all sources. 
So unlike a college account where a college 529 where you contribute 16,000 from several different sources, just 16,000 per year from all sources. Um, if that special needs individual is working, they can contribute another 12,880 per year in 2022. Keep in mind that there's a $100,000 maximum if you wanna still qualify for public benefits. If you don't, like, like you're, if you're on SSDI and you're not so worried about public benefits, then you can go above the 100,000. But if you wanna still qualify, for example, for SSI, then you don't wanna go above that 100,000 because everything above 100,000 will count uh, against your public benefits. So you wanna keep that in mind. Um, what's been nice about a, an ABLE is another mistake that people commonly make is when special needs individual or young, sometimes parents, grandparents open an UTMA, a Uniform Transfer to Minors Act account for a special needs individual. That will count as an asset against public benefits. Well, if you have that account open, you can transfer that money into an ABLE account at $16,000 a year. So that's a way to, to move money from an, uh, you know, any asset uh, that is in a special needs individual's name and then get it out. Um, so that's a way to, to solve that problem. You're only limited, you're limited to one ABLE account per individual. Um, qualified expenses or corporal, see the list here, housing, education, transportation, so it's quite liberal. Um, and it's really effective for paying for in-kind support and maintenance expenses like housing. So unlike money coming out of a special needs trust paying for housing, considered in-kind maintenance, money coming out of that trust will reduce your um, social secure SSI by a third. Money coming out of Enable will not. Okay, so it's a great supplement to a special needs trust. It should not replace a special needs trust. A special needs trust does a lot of other things like names as a trustee and, and has language to help, you know, to, to help support special needs individual and care providers and things like that. So it shouldn't replace, but it's a wonderful supplement. And remember, a special needs trust is generally an irre irrevocable trust at the highest tax rate. An ABLE account is tax-free. So it's a wonderful supplement. You should do both. And, and I can't think of a reason if you qualify for an ABLE account not to do one. Okay, it's, a, it's one of these things in financial planning that in my opinion is a slam dunk. Um, distribution at death, um, uh, the, the representative uh, of the, the, uh, of the um, ABLE account will determine who, the, um, uh, who, who gets the money. So for example, I'm, and, um, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm forgetting the terminology, but I'm the representative of my son's ABLE account. So if he were to pass away, I would dictate who gets the money. Um, uh, and uh, in California, if you have an out of state after to after 2023, if you have an out of state account, an out of state able, in other words, a non Cal able, they will try and you have a balance in an able account uh, that's not a Cal able, they will there will be a Medi Cal payback. OK, but if you have an out of state ABLE account today, um, AB 2216 was just passed. And so if you have it today, you don't have to worry about a Medi-Cal payback. But if you open an ABLE account outside of California after 2023, then and there is a balance in the ABLE account when the, the special needs individual passes away, there will be a payback. So money that you um, accumulate, you know, expenses that you accumulated through Medi-Cal, they will ask whatever money is in that ABLE account, they will come after to pay back Medi-Cal if it's an out-of-state ABLE. So you'll probably want to consider to open a Cal ABLE account. And you can see right here uh, the website to open a Cal ABLE account and, and that you just open it through that website. Uh, it's not that difficult. If for some reason you want to look at out-of-state 
uh, ABLE accounts. You can see here uh, ablenrc.org is a place to do it. Prior to this Medi-Cal payback, I think it made some sense to maybe look outside of, of California, but I'm not so sure it does now. Um, and you'll see that typically, uh, well, I know CalAble uh, does have a debit card. Uh, I think recently they had some problems with them, but they're, I think, sorting that out now. Um, so- Hey, John, can I ask like a dumb question just for clarification? Sure, and I doubt it. Able accounts? I um, doubt it. I doubt it's done, but go ahead. Well, let's say, I mean, because we live in this crazy expensive part of the world, right? So let's say you're paying your son's rent of like, let's just say $2,000 a month, right? Well, you can only put in $16,000 a year into the ABLE account, mm -hmm. right? So, and that it, that's $24,000 a year in rent. You have 16, so that's 8,000 you can't pay through the mm -hmm. ABLE account. Maybe you would pay the rest through the special needs trust. Maybe you have some other sources. Um, does that make a difference? Like when, when you're trying to get SSI for your kid, um, that not all the rent is paid, or does that just kind of reduce the amount that they'll receive by an incremental amount? That shouldn't impact SSI. I mean, what you get for SSI, because SSI is determined by your income and your assets. And so what you're paying out of an ABLE is not going to impact SSI, period. Okay. Because what's in, what's in the ABLE does not go into the equation. What you pay out of the ABLE does not go into the equation. So the, the only way it would go into the equation is if you have more than 100000 in your ABLE. Okay. All so, right. So you have to look at your other ass. And, and what's in your special needs trust is not going to go into the equation either. But that's why you have a special needs trust. The only thing that could impact anything that you just talked about is if you're paying for rent out of a special needs trust, that could reduce your monthly SSI by a third just for that month. Just for that month. Just for that month. But in terms of qualifying- How does this, because another stupid question, sorry about this. How does SSI know if you're paying um, through Enable or if you're paying through your trust or another means? I think just if they audit. Just if they audit. Okay. So if you're if you're currently paying through a trust, but you want to switch and start paying through the ABLE account, right, mm -hmm. to increase the monthly SSI payment, you mm -hmm. have to submit some sort of form to SSI. I've never done it. So I'm asking, like, you, you submit some form to them saying, hey, can you recalculate my kid's SSI? Um, are, they, are they reducing? Are, is, is your... You 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 have a daughter, especially his daughter, right? Oh, I have a, I have both. I have a son oh, and a that's daughter. Right, that's right. Okay. <laughs> um, um, so are they are they getting are they getting uh, the maximum like a little over a thousand SSI? My son uh, is the only one over eighteen. So okay. yeah, and he gets SSI and it's seven hundred and change, I think, and I think it's been reduced because he does. Uh, he does pay for rent through his special needs trust. That could be the reason. So yeah. if you have an ABLE, Jill, I would say start paying through the ABLE. So it could be, it could be one or two things. Uh, so he doesn't live at home with you, right? No longer. Yeah. And, but now are you claiming that he's paying rent? Are you showing, are you demonstrating that he's paying rent? I believe so. It's been a while since we've done the paperwork, but yes. So I would say it's one of two things. The reason why he's not getting max SSI, it's either that you're not demonstrating that he's paying rent and or uh, it's because you're paying out of the special needs trust. And if you pay out of the ABLE, that could, that could increase his SSI. And I don't know exactly the answer of how you demonstrate that, but I would reach out to ask if you start paying out of the ABLE, um, that should increase his SSI. And I would, I guess, reach out to SSI and, and show them that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, that's the, that is the full presentation. Um, I'll go back to the first page and just again, tell you, um, I think there's a delay here, but just say that you are welcome to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer your questions individually. There's my contact information. Um, it's John with no H at my open advisors or 925-65. Oh, I realize that my full phone number isn't on here. 
Um, and again, happy to have a, a consultation with you if you'd like. Yeah, add that six digit, everybody. Um, so um, yeah, and just, I wanna emphasize something. Um, I know that uh, we have a very, very diverse population of special needs families who follow us. Some have assets, some really don't have assets. I wanna um, stress that we do have another presentation we will be uploading. Um, by Kevin Urbach about public benefits. And he does a very good job of really going into detail about the various public benefits that are available to um, children and adults with developmental disabilities. And um, you know, everybody has a way to plan, whether they're using their own assets or whether they're using public assets. Um, there's always a need to plan no matter where you are on the financial spectrum. Um, I find most people are kind of in between and, you know, really have the need for both. Uh, very few people can do it completely on their own. Um, if, I, if I can just add to that, I, yeah. I, I know Kevin and I know I've presented with him and I know that I know that presentation. Unless you're super wealthy, you know, 20, 30 million, you don't absolutely don't care about benefits. The vast majority of people still want to maximize benefits. So I would uh, echo what Jill said, and I would say that's a great presentation to go to. Yeah, you, you definitely, you know, need, need both. And as I say, it's unfortunate that we special needs parents kind of have to get our PhDs in like financial planning and estate planning. It's really a lot to understand, um, but, you know, it, it pays in, in the long run. And I, I do want to say personally, um, I'm seeing more and more um, autism parents, um, you know, getting sick um, and passing away. We are getting older. Um, the bubble of autism parents, this, this generation is getting older. And I've seen quite a number of them pass away without really having done the planning that re really would have benefited their children, not only their special needs children, but also sometimes their typical children. So um, I, I just want to say it's worth the time. It's worth the investment um, to um, educate yourself, watch the videos, you know, consult with a professional um, it, 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 it will help in the long, for the long-term benefit of your loved one. T totally agree. And just to, to, just to add to that, um, you know, one of the things, and this is really in the uh, estate plannings, you know, the, the Urbach, Ellen Cookman, Lorna Drope, you know, Stephen Dale world. Um, one of the things that I think all of us who have special needs kids, one of the biggest decisions you have to make is the successor trustee of the trust. Who is it going to be? You know, and and the default so often is your child. You know, your your neurotypical child, which is, you know, probably not the right answer. And so, very often, what we talk about is a professional fiduciary, um, a, a nonprofit. I know we had a couple of nonprofits uh, who do this that were at the conference. Um, or, or a corporate trustee, and, and there's things you can do that involve your kids, like a, um, uh, like a trust protector that involves them, but doesn't make them the, the uh, successor trustee. So I don't want to get too far into that. Um, but anyway, that's, that's uh, just, to, you know, just to piggyback on what you were just saying, why it's so important to get this done. Um, a lot of people just don't, want to if you really think through it you don't mess so many people just have like one other sibling or one other child you know the special needs and and, and the neurotypical and it's you know is it really a burden you want to put on them entirely so anyway that's just a really important decision and something that a special needs attorney is going to help you um think through and solve yeah it, it's a huge and scary um problem very complicated problem we did have some presentations at the conference about you know, these successor roles, right? Because parents were, we are not permanent entities. We will, be, we will be gone and chances are our children will outlive us. So who will take on this role, right? That we've, that we've served. It's very difficult and whether those are friends or whether it's family or whether it's professionals, it's gonna be different in every situation. And we're, we're gonna try to get um, some videos in this series uh, that really target, target those questions, which, which are difficult. So, 
Um, with that, thank you so, so much, John, um, for everything um, you do for our community. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Jill. Thanks for having me.